Okay, welcome back to the Regenerative Health Podcast. Tonight, I'm sitting down once again with Dr. Sean O'Mara. Now, Dr. O'Mara is a lifestyle physician and a human performance optimizing physician. And he is doing very, very interesting work with his clients in the US and using the uh, MRI scan for visceral fat and other uh, fat ectopic fat deposits, um, fat in the wrong places in order to help uh, drive lifestyle changes uh, and advice for his patients. I would recommend everyone uh, start by going back and actually listening to our our first conversation because it will really um, give you a bit bit of background of what we're going to be talking about in, in this episode. So Sean, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, Max. Well, thank you for uh, having me come back. I, I always enjoy our conversations and coming on your show, and I hope your uh, audience uh, and followers do as well. Yeah, so we, we've been talking a lot offline about uh, this approach and this paradigm that, Sean, you're really pioneering in the US. And that is one of identifying the basically the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to people's health and people's uh, likelihood of of becoming ill and getting heart disease, cancers, uh, dementias, or all the problems of of uh, modern chronic disease, and and that that problem is is fat and specifically fat in in the wrong place. So to to give the listener Sean a bit of an idea about how you think about uh, fat, especially with regard to obesity and why perhaps this this idea that we most people are given about body mass index, uh, just plain obesity and overweight, just lacks lacks nuance in in, in my and your uh, opinion. Yeah, well, I think it's just a generalization and it starts in medical school and that uh, generalized approach that, uh, um, you know, fat is fat, uh, basically is permeated the practice of medicine today. And it it gets imparted to our physician, our, our patients as physicians. And th- that's a, that's unfortunately uh, a sad reality of why I think our profession in large part um, is extremely uh, ineffective at really improving the health of individuals. I mean, basically um, it's the largest part of our economy and I'm pretty confident it's probably the largest part of your economy there in Australia as well healthcare, if it's such a dominant part of our economy, it's it's right at the top and nothing is bigger than healthcare. Uh, it's bigger than energy. It's bigger than, um, you know, any other service, service line part of our economy. So, and the majority of it is chronic disease. And I think the fault of it is we lump um, fat into, into one category and don't understand it. And so, um, Once we're educated to it, to the extent that you and I understand it now, I think we can begin to break it down in a way that uh, transforms our healthcare from a system that is simply propagating disease and and profiting from it even to one where humans begin to actually improve their level of health. And our responsibility, Max, early in this um, uh, is very early specialty of uh, health optimization is to make sure that we do so in a commercially viable uh, platform. You know, we as uh, physician scientists in this particular space need to be able to see that it is um, through the world, uh, the wheels of commerce that healthcare needs to be delivered, but um, it has to be an appropriate quid pro quo. And f- patients don't go to physicians to um, just to just to pay them money. They they really um, are being foisted on them medications, um, and they they think they're getting healthy, but all that is really happening is medications are are being exchanged with them, and in the long run, they continue to worsen, and they just tolerate it because they excuse it by um, their age. They think that you know you get worse as you age. You don't get worse as you age. I'm strongly advocating that you actually should get better. We should use our knowledge to get better. And that's where uh, it starts with fat. So the importance is to really understand that all fat is not the same. Uh, You and I have uh, uh, an awareness about the different depots of fat. 
And so um, it's all lumped together basically by a satellite conventional physicians, BMI and the same. But to start it off here, let's first point out the, um, the, the first real um, problem with uh, a certain type of fat, and that is with visceral fat. So visceral fat is different from subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat is just underneath your skin, and visceral fat is fat deep within uh, your abdomen surrounding your viscera. So this, it is uh, fat uh, within your uh, abdominal lining. You cannot see it. You cannot feel it. The only way you can really, two ways to see it is either through surgery, where you directly visualize it, or through um, me medical imagery like an MRI. So the better you view it, <clears throat> and I'm, listening, I'm addressing your, your audience now, the better you can process it and the better you can deal with it. So um, I'm a strong advocate of uh, MRI imagery to visualize it. Uh, you can quantify it through DEXA scans, bioimpedance, and ultrasound. Um, but these modalities don't allow you to visualize it. And there's a big distinction. I'm sure we'll be talking about that. But visceral fat is the first of those depots. And there's... Um, uh, another, it's really visceral, uh, visceral fat too, but it's specifically fat around the heart, pericardial fat. So fat that clings and surrounds our organs um, are problematic because they have uh, an inflammatory nature to them. So visceral fat and pericardial fat, it's also um, can be called by the layperson as heart fat or fat around the heart, um, has um, metabolically uh, active and a metabolically active state where it's inflammatory. And so the, uh, the nature of it is very different from subcutaneous fat. And the third fat that, that, uh, I'd like to introduce is, uh, called muscle fat or the medical term for it is myosteatosis. And you, these, these, uh, um, fat, fat within the muscle could actually be further subcategorized, but we'll just generally refer to it as fat in the muscle. And the other way to think about it for the audience is human marbling. So most of the audience listening today will be familiar with steak marbling or, mar or, or marbleized beef. And uh, a popular, you know, form of that is, is uh, Wagyu beef. Uh, but the, the, that is achieved by a high carbohydrate diet in the in that animal and low exercise, and that pretty well kind of sums up the state of Western uh, Western people. The population today in in the United States and Australia, I think, have too many carbohydrates and a lack of proper exercise, and so it results in accumulation of uh, marbleized uh, skeletal muscle in humans. And we can see this by MRI. And it also um, very, very strongly correlates to visceral fat. In fact, I have yet to see an example of anybody that has visceral fat and doesn't have skeletal muscle or vice versa. And the same thing um, with heart fat. So they, um, they, the, all three of them correlate. And they correlate with each other. And they correlate with a high carbohydrate lifestyle with low exercise and basically a life, a life being led without um, understanding awareness of how to actually improve their health. So they're going with the flow and the majority of people are in there. The fourth bio, biometric that I'll introduce for the very first time for, for your show and for the, uh, the benefit of your listening audience is deep subcutaneous fat. And this is a, a fat that's you can see layered out in, in, in subcutaneous fat, and it is separated by fascia, and you can actually see it on MRI, and it's the part of the subcutaneous fat that is closest to the muscle. The superficial subcutaneous fat is closest to the skin, and it, it's important enough for nature to separate it by this fascial plane that looks like a black line on MRI, and uh, so it's, it's important because uh, very interesting, it behaves like visceral fat. It's metabolically active. 
It reduces your largely beneficial uh, cholesterol called HDL, and it uh, contributes to higher levels of um, cardiovascular disease and uh, obesity. Uh, so you really want to be aware of deep subcutaneous fat. So to sum it up, visceral fat, heart fat, muscle fat, and now deep subcutaneous fat. These are the four depots of fat that you want to be aware of and watch. And, and then you want to have a generally benign, if not uh, favorable view towards superficial subcutaneous fat or that portion of what is generally called subcutaneous fat, but specifically the superficial layer, because it has a molecule in it called adiponectin. And adiponectin is associated with lower levels of obesity. And it also has this protective benefit from cardiovascular disease and atherosclerotic, uh, atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease in particular. And so it helps to re reduce obesity and it also helps to improve our metabolism. But very interesting, it helps to drive consumed calories towards the, the direction away from visceral fat. So adiponectin helps to, it's that part of our um, system, our process, that helps us to not form bad fat and to form good fat. So the, the, uh, the benefit to having superficial subcutaneous fat is it helps to keep us from developing the bad kind of fat. So let me just sum this all up by saying, you know, it's not enough for your audience to be stepping on a, on a bathroom scale and thinking that they are in any way having a serious approach towards managing their health. It is really nece necessary for you to uh, be able to distinguish between the different types of fat and um, and not have this this very close minded myopic approach to managing health with a bathroom scale or even something like um, a slightly refined bathroom scale like a an impedance bio impedance scale which can separate muscle from fat uh, which is a step in the right direction but to get into these more um, exploitable targets of bad fat and exploitable targets of good fat, particularly the superficial subcutaneous fat, you, you have to go into the realm of uh, medical imagery using MRI, and uh, it's very different. But the last comment I will say is, as a health and performance opti optimizing physician, I have seen a, a number of biomarkers <clears throat> on the skin and external to the body that in the future, <clears throat> I hope to be able to articulate and discuss and share with other physicians and hopefully drive into medical schools, how the body, the outside of the body, uh, its shape and appearance changes for the purposes of allowing patients to leverage those biomarkers to improve their level of health. In other words, we have lived really for 4 million years and uh, you know a very, very long period of time and have done very well without sophisticated technology to track these things. And I think it's it's lost body of knowledge. You know, I think uh, humans, our species, have gotten away from this. And in large part, it's been driven by our professions, Max. You know, we have pushed blood work and, and uh, uh, medical technology uh, to the unfortunate loss of these, of simply tracking. Um, you don't want a big dad bot. You don't want a belly sticking out. And uh, I think that, you know, we, we uh, unfortunately play a role in the responsibility for the amount of disease um, that our species has. So anyway, those are some nice introductory comments that uh, I thought would be important to, to be able to share with the audience right from the get-go. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sean. Look, the way uh, I also want to kind of break it down for people and, and the way I like to think about is that if, if you imagine if you have a four by four grid and you have you know people who are normal weight and people who are overweight and that's on one axis and on the other axis you have metabolically healthy and metabolically unhealthy so if you're if you're a normal weight and you're metabolically healthy well then if we uh, ran you through a, a an MRI scanner you'd you'd have no visceral fat and you'd have you know little subcutaneous fat but there's people who are 
uh, normal weight, but if again we 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 scanned them, you would you would see a whole bunch of visceral fat in there, and maybe they'd have a little bit of abdominal protuberance. Th- those people, Sean, that you see are um, what what are called TOFI or thin on the outside, fat on the inside, and they share the same metabolic risk as someone who is overweight and has visceral fat and is is metabolically unhealthy. And then there's a there's the the fourth kind of uh, square is the metabolically healthy obese and that that's a someone who is overweight who has a you know a larger bmi but all their fat deposits are probably superficial subcutaneous um meaning that they they're basically at baseline uh risk of developing chronic diseases and, and cardiovascular disease because all their fat depots are, are in that uh, inert uh kind of compartment so the the all that to say is that we can't rely on uh, the tape measure um, or the the scales, uh, as you said, Sean, or bioimpedance or, or other crude measurements to really get an, an accurate idea of of risk of developing chronic disease. Um, really, we have to be looking, and now that you've told us again about this de- a deep uh, subcutaneous uh, fat, is that we really need to be looking, and MRI is the best modality for, for a number of reasons. Yeah, no, that's really good. I love the... Uh your capacity, it really, um, you know, Max, to, to be able to organize these different categories to, to, to help your followers and to help your patients being able to grasp the, the important differences um, in, in states of health be, between, um, between humans in our population. So I think that's incredibly important. You probably should have that as a big chart. Uh, it, it probably should be in every physician's uh, office. And uh, and probable and and to, to that to that point should be in every health class in uh, schools across Australia, the United States, and all over the world, so that people can start to understand what is going on. And right now, they're just you know it's all commerce. They just lump it all together. And so if you mm-hmm. if you can't understand the distinctions, how are you ever going to make decisions about your life? How are you yeah. going to be able to make the choices? that are necessary to uh, get in the desirable box uh, that you want to be in. And I think there's very little interest on the part of conventional healthcare and uh, even uh, stronger um, and active uh, opposition uh, towards that kind of an awareness in the average human uh, from big pharma. And uh, it's probably simply a business uh, protective model that um, you know, it's, it's based on the, the uh, sustaining of disease to be able to exploit it through medications, because if there is no disease, there's no market for these particular drugs. Yeah, and, no, exactly oh, right. So go on, Sean. And the, the other point I'll make and just finish it up is that um, there is very little disease on the globe within all species of animals, except for humans we uniquely stand out amongst the species that roam the earth and inhabit the earth for being the most disease afflicted. And that should wake up and shock everyone that there is something really wrong that a species, uh, Homo sapiens, should be such a profound outlier. We are outliers for other ways in terms of our cerebral cortex and our capacity for communicating and thinking and doing and creating. But that sh- those outliers should not be in any way um, justification for us to be more diseased. If anything, we should have even less forms of disease. So I foresee with the proper approach that humans could have far less disease um, and enjoy even better health spans than animals in the wild but for our lack of knowledge, how to do that generally among our population. So it's incumbent upon those of us who are in the health optimizing space as physicians and advocates for health optimization. I don't think you have to be an MD or a physician to um, advocate for health optimization. You simply have to have an awareness and understanding for it uh, to be able to promote it so we can start moving uh, in that direction. Yeah, and two two points. I mean, the, we can understand why this nuance isn't being actively promoted uh, in in a pharmaceutical based paradigm, because it, from a business point of view, 
it, it makes sense to not identify tofis as metabolically unwell because they're soon going to become diabetic and there's no point in uh, preventing them from becoming di- diabetic because then you're going to take away a, a potential uh, customer. And then there's no interest in identifying the metabolically healthy obese from the metabolically unhealthy obese because you want to sell everyone a Zempic uh, who, who has a, a, a BMI above um, above 25 or 30 um, instead of you know saying, hang on, you, you're actually metabolically all right, despite being overweight. So, so we can see how how the uh, business model is again um, this strategic ambiguity and strategic uh, lack of looking into these very very important distinctions that Sean and I are talking about in order to 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 keep the kind of um, the the money rolling in. the The other point I'd, I'd like to make is, you know, our radiology colleagues, uh, Sean, when it comes to oncology and you know the amount of pet just absolutely incredibly tech, technology that underlies certain types of PET scanning. The the amount of of intellectual capital that is exists to identify all kinds of nuanced and very very um, very uh, esoteric medical uh, pathology. Yet the biggest elephant in the room, which we've started this podcast by talking about, which are these ectopic fat deposits. They're so obvious. They can be seen on CT. They can be seen on MRI. They're not actively being reported. So it's it just speaks to the misallocation of, of intellectual um, horsepower that the thing that patients could most change to improve their health simply isn't being reported on. Yeah. No, that is so true. Um, it, it, they're not being reported on. It's worth saying that they are never reported on. Um, they're not uh, educated on it in uh, medical school. Residency programs um, certainly would have to identify that visceral fat uh, exists because in the, the average human, including probably everybody listening to this podcast, the largest part of the real estate within the admin of a human is going to be likely visceral fat, this highly inflammatory disease causing depot of a very dangerous fat. And yet the radiologist um, sees right past it and never reports it. It's just, it's an extraordinary phenomenon that is, is tolerated, you know, by our uh, profession of medicine. And uh, it's, it's really just out of ignorance. I think at the same time, a radiologist, um, you know, probably I'm imagining a conversation and you should, because I think you have a friend or a brother or somebody in uh, radiology practice, you should ask them about the first time they heard about visceral fat within their radiology program. And I imagine it was, uh, when they were a, a first year resident radiology or maybe a, a med student. And they said, what is all this white stuff here? And they would, and the older radiologist said, well, that's visceral fat. And uh, they go, oh, okay. And that would probably it. <laughs> that would probably be the, their extent of uh, education. And they and, and those, you know, it's just probably even primary care doctors, um, I show them MRIs and go through CTs with them. They can't identify visceral fat. It's extraordinary to me. <laughs> it's just, they're looking right at it. I'm like, that's all visceral fat. And they go, what? It, what is? What are you talking about? I said, all that black stuff and they move closer <laughs> it's just it's a surreal experience to to walk a, a physician colleague through uh something as significant as um uh, you know in terms of the the field as visceral fat and then begin to introduce the awareness to them of just how dangerous it is and how we're not taught about it it's just it's surreal no and and we you know we we spoke in the first episode about exactly what uh, causes the deposition of visceral fat, and, I'd, and we're not going to talk about it on this episode. So I'd invite everyone to go back and listen to to that one for to to realize it, or find out the the five things that that you, Sean, have really noticed kind of uh, cause the deposition of visceral fat. But this is not uh, an unknown kind of science, uh, like like so much of areas of preventative medicine. There's a there's an abundance of literature on the harm of visceral fat and you know we were talking privately about the oncology literature and you can basically type in uh, any type of cancer that you want ovarian cancer uh, rectal uh, adenocarcinoma um, you know any kind of cancer and 
there's been uh, because they do staging. People get staging CTs as part of their oncology follow up. So they this type of uh, data is really easy to collect, and they just look at who lives longer, and and they they look at the amount of visceral fat someone has and the outcome with their cancer. And it's just time and time again, it's such a strong predictor of who's going to do, who's going to die sooner, who's going to get sicker is the amount of visceral fat they have. So, you know, if the oncology um, uh, profession, if the oncology profession, but more like even the um, oncology patient support groups were really, um, you know, doing the right thing by patients, they would, their first piece of advice would be, should be, you know, avoid having any extra visceral fat and ask your oncologist to get a reading of your visceral fat on one of your staging CTs that's already been done. Yeah, that's such a, a really good point. And I, I love that you are throwing out um, awareness and, and uh, even challenging uh, patient advocacy, advocacy groups within the different areas of uh, conditions that are out there. And there are you know, numbers, even if not, uh, you could probably be described as thousands of these kind of organizations. And they help to drive the discussion between patients and physicians. So, you know, having this kind of awareness will, I think, only contribute and help uh, to to change the paradigm uh, uh, about what really is effective uh, to help people that are struggling with disease. And on your point, it it's remarkable to me, and I've said it, you know, uh, on on Twitter, and uh, I regularly re- routinely discuss this on in social media. That for people that have certain conditions, they can simply put that condition in Google uh, or their search in or whatever they'd like to do, comma visceral fat, and explore uh, the contribution causation association with um, every c- condition that's out there. It's it's remarkable the role uh, and the extensive. Um, uh, nature that visceral fat plays with regard to disease of humans. And you could do a similar exercise with cholesterol. And you'll see that um, there is just a, a lack of correlation to all these different diseases. And then you ask yourself, huh, this thing is associated with everything and is causing harm and problematic. Uh, cholesterol is got the poorest association and isn't part of, you know, what I'm afflicted with. Why is it that when I go to my doctor, um, the conversations dominated um, by uh, a discussion of uh, cholesterol and not visceral fat? Well, the simple answer comes down to money. I mean, that really is the case. Um, it's the objective within the, to best describe uh, your 15 minute encounter, which is likely all that you'll get at the most, uh, with five minutes, um, you know, with your FaceTime with your doctor, um, uh, your doctor typically has about 15 minutes to, uh, think about you as a patient and, uh, the guiding objective of that, unfortunately is, um, not how do we biologically improve that patient, but how do we capture that encounter in a way that maximizes first my money and, uh, and to um, behind all that, uh, that be assured if you're a physician listening to this, uh, your healthcare system is not uh, object is objectively designed to increase your money as a physician, but their own money. So you got money, money, money all being designed. And I'd like to see an electronic medical record Um, that is chiefly designed to uh, optimize uh, the health of patients and that there you it would be very easy to do and very effective to do to create uh, the necessary key biological indicators and I would start with the four uh, that we 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 discussed here visceral fat pericardial fat muscle fat and then deep subcutaneous fat uh, to be included in that and then looking at superficial a subcutaneous fat with a favorable view, and then uh, lean, uh, lean skeletal muscle, and visible pulses, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, that should be a part of the electronic medical record that that are not, because right now every EMR is designed for profitability rather than optimizing human beings. But I. If you're a real entrepreneur and you started developing an EMR that did that, you'd make 
um, you'd make you'd make a killing as soon as patients, uh, consumers. I, I think they probably should be called. I think calling people patients uh, allows us to give them a special level of of, uh, of status in a different uh, category um, that basically, you know, I think allows the worst possible existence to be the biggest part of our system for our economy. It's just, it's so ripe for a disruption and uh, because it's so bad at what it does um, and there's so much money to be made. So um, if we can help guide us in a direction where we take care of people and then um, also get our compensation comes from the fact that we are really optimizing and improving people's health, then I think uh, we have the capacity really to drive this towards uh, a transformational change. Yeah, no, uh, I love it, Sean. And and to your point about you know biomarker identification in under the current paradigm, it it really is um, the degree to which a biomarker is emphasised under this current paradigm is the degree to which it can be profit profited from. Maybe may, that's like Occam's razor. We maybe we can call it uh, Omara's razor. But uh, you know, the patient will walk into the to to a conventional consult and the exact things that get emphasized the most, whether that's their total serum cholesterol or or uh, their their blood sugar, uh, their their uh, blood glucose level, they, these are simply um, they're emphasized because they're pr- predominantly because they can be manipulated with with pharmaceutical interventions. And the the big ticket item that you know you've just we've just talked about um, visceral fat is is so far from being being talked about it's like um and i and i really like uh um, um uh i really like to give analogies to mechanics because it's easily relatable imagine if um you know you people took your car into the mechanic with a massive crack in the window and you know they did your your service and they gave you your car back and it still had a big crack in the window i mean that that <laughs> i th- I think that's that's what's happening with um, patients who go to their doctor and, and they don't get told or even given a tool to identify their visceral fat. It's like, you know, we had one job and we couldn't do that properly. Yeah. Well, the other, I do like those car mechanic examples. Uh, 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 along that, I always always like to say uh, to point out, not only they they're not not good at at, at fixing the, the car and, and preventing problems. Um, they, th- when you're in line to show up at the garage, the command, the, co- the, uh, the mechanic shows up with this old clunker that is making all this horrible noise. It's smoke is coming out, uh, stuff are falling apart all over it. So he's, he or she is basically evidencing that they don't know how to take care of their own car. And then they're going to try to take care of yours. And, and it's just, uh, remarkable that, um, consumers, people continue to go to doctors um, that they themselves are profoundly unhealthy. I remember the last time I was in a doctor's office with my uh, one of my uh, children, uh, we were at orthopedic surgeon for uh, a, 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 a bone issue. And uh, the orthopedic surgeon had to swing himself, take two attempts to get himself out of the chair, you know, because he was so heavy. And um, I, I thought in my mind, you know, uh, I'm going to be getting health advice from this guy. <laughs> and of course, the, the advice he gave was, um, you know, to my way of thinking, of course, I will say I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, unhelpful. And uh, it improved to be that case. I mean, uh, my, my son was able to uh, solve his uh, issues um, just by changing his lifestyle. Uh, rather than um, accepting the, the advice that was given to him by an orthopedic surgeon that was guided by making money. So, yeah, mm, well, yeah. actually, and I'll, I'll tell the story. It's, my son had a, a sway back, you know, very bad, very awful looking sway back. And uh, so we cut out carbohydrates. Um, he followed my life optimizing steps. And in the three years since that time, he's corrected uh, his back through um, just improvements in his musculature. Now his back is nice and straight and erect, and uh, he's, he's become an extraordinarily, um, you know, healthy looking in appearance compared to that scrawny kid whose back had lacked the appropriate musculature and performance to 
keep him erect and straight. And, and so, yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm my God, you know, just crazy, you know, just by living better, he's, has improved his, his physique. And, and Sean saved a wallet biopsy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. Uh, well, well, this this is a great uh, opportunity to talk about MRI scanning, particularly for visceral fat. Because, look, the way I think about it, um, I, I like to draw an analogy to a test called the the CT calcium score. And some some people listening might have already had a calcium score. And essentially, the story behind the calcium score was it's a very low dose CT scan of of the heart, and it basically looks for the presence of, of calcification uh, in the coronary arteries. And what that does is gives us a, a very much uh, increased ability to predict someone's risk of, of having a heart attack. The, the point I want to, why I brought that up is because this wasn't a test that was pushed from up above. This was a test that was basically from a ground, ground grassroots type level um, patients demanded it, and that's how it became more more widespread. So uh, uh, it was a, basically a tool of preventative health that that has been, um, you know, it's been impactful, and everyone's people have got different opinions about it. But I think it's it's on the whole been been a positive uh, a positive step in the right direction. But I bring it up because I think visceral fat MRI, and particularly Sean, what you're doing, and you're the pioneer of this, we we have the same ability and the same opportunity to promote. A visceral fat MRI as the next um, CAC score in terms of empowering our patients to to live their healthiest lives, because um, the, the 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 paradigm that we've just talked about um, isn't going to be freely recommending the the a visceral fat MRI. Patients are going to have to demand it, and I guess through through interviews and discussions like this, we're hoping to to educate people as to why they should be asking their physician for it, and then eventually, when enough people ask for it, um, you know, radiology practices will will uh, no doubt um, answer to the the, the market demand and, and hopefully offer it. So um, that's that's my my I guess call to action I guess. In terms of this test, particularly, and I think Sean, you've done the the massive work and the studies to to demonstrate how effective it is. Um, but I think it's up to the rest of the doctors listening to to learn and then hopefully promote it and, and patients to demand it. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Well said. And I, I think you know grassroots um, understanding and then promotion behind this uh, is going to raise the the uh, dialogue and discussion about. Uh, visceral fats so that people uh, begin to demand and s- search it out. And uh, for those of us in this space that are already um, have identified uh, the importance of, uh, of uh, going after visceral fat and uh, imaging it so that uh, uh, our, our consumers, our clients and patients coming to us can benefit from that. Uh, we're, we're, we, we need to propagate and, and do the best we can. It's a huge market out there. But, uh, you know, I'll just say I am not uh, aware of anything else that's more important, more effective at optimizing the health, improving the health of a human than um, getting rid of visceral fat and getting rid of these bad, dangerous um, fat depots uh, in the body. And it's certainly excel way past um, the darling of uh, conventional healthcare, which is uh, cholesterol. And I'm fond of pointing out that nobody uh, should uh, or is is likely ever had an experience where they've met another person that said, yeah, I paid attention to my cholesterol and it's had this huge impact or even any measurable impact for me on my health. I mean, it's just basically take these pills and if anything, you, you end up with side effects from the use of those uh, statins. Um, and, and I, you know, I don't, um, I don't want anybody to uh, make a decision about their health care. If another prescriber has prescribed something, you know, for you about a statin, I think you need to go back and have a, a discussion about that. I think that um, it's, it's fair to point out that there, there are these side effects and that they're not um, it's not the only alternative that are available to, to patients, but, you know, it, I think it's worth pointing out that some people uh, need medications and are using them and uh, you don't want to stop a medicine. Certainly there are cases of medications that people use that precipitously stopping them can be uh, life-threatening and very dangerous. So 
um, especially, you know, steroids and things that people get themselves on. But I think a lot of those medications that are currently out there uh, would not be needed uh, were we to have the appropriate discussions at the right time with humans um, and, and health classes and, uh, and, and, and physician offices. Uh, we, w- we wouldn't have to, to have that. But these, these markers are available. They need to be discussed. They need to be promoted. I love the grassroots, you know, uh, kind of a, I, um, analogy uh, about promoting it. I think CACs are, uh, CAC scores are great because they are contributing to that discussion. But I see uh, the MRI being far more effective because you, you're not just a uh, rear facing, um, looking at bio uh, markers on, um, uh, on a, a calcium calcifications on a CT scan. You're looking at, um, uh, soft, soft plaques with an MRI. You can look at atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and real time threat with visceral fat. I mean, it's right there. It's working it, and it's uh, inflammatory, um, calcifications on a CAC score. If you like those, they're, they're basically, um, disease that you had that was inflammatory and a, th- and a threat that's been calcified by the body's attempt to cool it off. So um, I love that it is raising awareness and uh, I get people routinely coming to me with CAC scores, uh, but you you can have a zero CAC score and have a heart attack if you have soft plaques and those are the ones that that are the threat of as far as you know heart attacks. Um, but boy, with an MRI, there's such a richer yield. And uh, so, yeah, let's build on the the success of uh, CAC scores and and uh, CT scanning that that is currently uh, uh, out there and growing, I think, in, in use and uh, promote the same thing with MRIs. And, you know, to, you know, because I'm a health optimizer physician, I lay lay in bed at night um, and I, won't, I spend my day, a good portion of my day, trying to figure out how do we optimize more people. And uh, part of the problem with the MRI, and I hear, you know, fairly, uh, well, every day is the cost of the MRI. And unfortunately, it is, it's a product of how it's uh, promulgated, how it's actually performed. And so the, the conventional MRI as it's done today, is a series of, uh, of uh, scans at different levels throughout the abdominal cavity. Well, what if we were to do a scan just for wellness purposes, instead of chasing all the different potential targets of disease, uh, scanning from you know the bottom of the abdomen all the way to the top, uh, with a view to uh, having a thorough abdominal exam and going through the conventional read that a uh, radiologists would look at all the different organs and systems that are um, observable on an MRI scan or a CT scan for that matter. What if we simply looked at a single slice and asked the questions, uh, what can we see here to actually improve patients' level of health? And that's the kind of discussion and contribution I would like to have uh, make to make to our profession. And I see in the future the capacity and a necessity to have a single slice level, probably uh, at L3, um, uh, lumbar three uh, within the spine, which is a standard target that we could look at. There are in fact studies that have already said that we can look at visceral fat um, at a single layer and uh, be able to come up with a good um, uh, reading about uh, visceral fat that is we we see is uniformly distributed within the abdomen. It's not something that, uh, you know, it tends to be right around the gallbladder or down around the pelvic organs. No, it's, it's uniformly distributed. And for that reason, it's like muscle fat. For that reason, we can sample uh, almost any area of the abdomen and get a good idea. So that being the case, um, why not just sample one area? Uh, why not uh, with a with an objective to make it faster and more uh, affordable. And then you could, you could go in and uh, simply uh, look at your uh, visceral fat with a single slice. And it sort of takes, uh, instead of doing um, 
you know, I, I liken it to, and so doing a blood test where you're doing venipuncture, uh, it's like a finger prick and uh, make it easier and faster and more, cons- you know, uh, friendly to the consumer. Then we could cut down the costs and, and, and ever make it uh, more uh, uh, available to the average person. Right now, my clients, unfortunately, because um, I'm a health optimizing physician and also a researcher, um, I, you know, uh, it's, it's expensive to get those MRIs and, and follow up scans. So it typically requires a certain level of economics, uh, to be able to afford it. And, uh, um, and I want to try to change that. And we, you know, in my original practice that I was part of, uh, that was funded by the national science foundation. It was, uh, I was the only MD. There was one other MD and he was a PhD and everybody else were PhD engineers and uh, just brilliant researchers. And we'd sit and try to figure out ways to change the engineering systems in MRIs to make them, you know, bring them more efficiently down to the realm of maybe doing scans. Uh, we hope to be able to do scans at about $20 for an MRI. Uh, but that, that level of uh, engineering was uh, uh, expensive and, um, and, and it was a, uh, uh, driving the the uh, technology in a direction, making it less profitable. So it makes a lot of money when you can charge twenty three hundred dollars for an MRI scan. I mean that brings in a lot of um, you know price margins that are attracted to <clears throat> conventional healthcare. So when you start changing a medical image technology uh, from twenty three hundred dollars to twenty dollars, well, that's a real game changer, and that's going to have up levels of permutation that are going to be very challenging for a system. But that's that's where we need to need to go, Max. I think we got to figure out how we, as medical clinicians, start driving the the profession, the applications of uh, technology uh, to make them more affordable, so that we can actually uh, really get more people to optimize their health. Yeah, and uh, I think that. Uh, the MRI is so good for for a number of reasons, and to to again give the listener a bit of a background, MRI stands for um, magnetic resonance imaging, and it's basically one of the the biggest kind of gun in the tool shed of our of radiology and the medical profession in terms of the the ability to visualize and high resolution visualize what's actually going on on in the body. The the reason. Uh, uh, Sean is talking about MRI and we're talking about MRI instead of CT scanning is that uh, MRI does not uh, expose you as a patient to to any ionizing radiation. So there's no risk of, of or harm of um, on, on the scale of CT scanning in terms of getting this as a, as a preventative health measure. So it's high, high resolution and it's uh, and it's not and it's very safe. The the point that you made about um, uh, doing a single slice at lumbar three, the lumbar three uh, level is great, and and it really it kind of reminds me of Elon Musk's uh, strategy to kind of democratize access to uh, electric cars. You know, you bring the first one out; it's a it's a, a Model S. It's very expensive, and it's only for people with with financial means. But uh, hopefully, we'll get a product like this in in the next five ten years. We're going to be able to have act, give people access to a single slice uh, abdominal MRI for visceral fat for you know less than fifty dollars, ideally, and that will be a, a great tool that people can use for their first time, their second time, their tenth time to just see the progress that they're making um, when when they are come for, when they're doing a health optimization lifestyle program. So uh, I think. Uh, Sean, maybe that that's uh, the way to think about it. If we can uh, hopefully get enough people interested in it and then enough demand, hopefully uh, it'll be a, a supply and demand thing that more radiology practices will offer it and then that the price will hopefully fall that way. But that, those are all details that are, that, are, that are to be determined, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, another interesting point um, and I think important point to make to your audience and to you as well as a, as a practicing physician today is uh, one that uh, in many cases, abdominal scans have already been done. They're simply unexploited. We have not used them for the purposes of uh, uh, interpreting them from a viewpoint to optimize the health of people. So what I'm uh, trying to point out is Many people have already had CTs of their abdomens. The CT abdominal scans are um, pr- 
probably, at least in the United States, not probably, I would say, uh, are, are done far, uh, far in excess of what they should be done. I know in the ER, uh, if anybody came in with a, and, and there was, you know, recorded it on the, uh, the chart at Donald Payne, it's very likely that there's going to be a CT scan done uh, by the, the emergency medicine physician. Whether it was really indicated or not, uh, I'll tell you what, what will happen. That physician will write in the chart justification for getting that uh, just because they want to protect themselves. They don't really, it's not their body that's going to be exposed to all that radiation. They're not paying for it. And quite frankly, they're going to make a lot of money off of it. So uh, it, it ends up going in that direction. But once have, once it has been done, then why not, if you're listening today, why not demand to see your downhill CT? Why not look and, and see how much visceral fat you have? And uh, I have, uh, you know, YouTube videos on my YouTube channel, if you're listening, um, where I show, go through MRI scans of the abdomen and CT scans of the abdomen. And visceral fat shows up as the, the center white mass on, on a downhill uh, MRI. And on a CT of the abdomen, it's just the inverse of that. So fat shows up instead of uh, being white like it is on an MRI, fat uh, on a CT shows up as black. So it's the black center mass inside um, a, a downhill CT that you can see uh, visceral fat present. And so if you've ever had an abdominal CT, go and look at it. You're going to have to interpret it because uh, you can look at, you know, just for fun, just say, well, Sean was right. Um, you know, the, the report does not even mention all this visceral fat that was present within my abdomen. And uh, then you can ask, you know, get get ticked off. You know, it, we if we're going to change the system, we need some passion out there. And we need some indignation over the fact um, that you had all this disease in your body and it was ignored. And in many cases, the, the only reading you basically got was that you were normal. Well, I would submit to you, if the largest part of your abdomen is filled with a, a, an inflammatory disease process that's destroying your health and insidiously developing further disease throughout your body, that you're anything but normal. You might be uh, commonplace, but that is not a normal state for a human being to be in or to tolerate. So go back, look at your CTs. And then with regard to visceral fat, it's important to understand two things. It's not just how much you have, but how long you've had it for. So what really causes the problem, you know, for humans and insidiously develops disease over a period of time, worsening disease is the exposure to this visceral fat over a period of time. So you could in fact have a fairly small or modest amount of visceral fat, but over a period of time, it has a very um, deleterious effect over your health, uh, contributing to the decline of your health over a period of time. And then uh, unfortunately for those that have a larger amount and over a longer period of time, it's proportionally more disease that you'll be exposed to. And so I make the point, uh, and there are studies that show this, you can remove visceral fat um, and, uh, you know, immediately there's not a huge change in somebody's condition, um, you know, when, when that happens. So, uh, but over a period of time, there's less inflammation because it's, it's been removed, but um, the organism, and usually these are animal models because I'm not aware of a single human model where that's ever been done, but uh, um, the, the, uh, the organism goes on to accumulate um, visceral fat and that further causes problems. And so um, basically you really need to understand that it's the exposure to that over a period of time. I have a, uh, I've made it an uh, example on some of my YouTubes how uh, my belly is sticking out and uh, I get an abdominal MRI of my, my, my abdomen and I don't have any visceral fat and my belly is sticking out. 
So I like to ask my clients when they show up and I ask on the podcast, why is my belly sticking out if I don't have visceral fat? And the answer is because I have visceral fat for 55 years. And, uh, you know, I found that it took me, you know, it took me two to three years for all that visceral fat to, to go away. And, uh, um, but I'm still left with the, the consequences, the residual effects of that highly inflammatory, you know, uh, fat depot disease process that was ignored by, by me as a human and, uh, by every physician that, that I had gone to never discussing, you know, awareness of visceral fat. And so I had this slow but steady decline of my health and accumulation of disease. And the really encouraging thing is once it is removed, then when you start, uh, adopting, you know, and, and practicing a healthy life, you get a much better, uh, return, uh, in the absence of visceral fat on the decisions that you make. In other words, um, two different people can go to a job, do the exact same thing, and they should get paid the same way. But when it comes to visceral fat, that's not the case. So two different human beings go and lift weights. One has very little visceral fat. The other one has a lot. They're not paid the same way in terms of muscle growth. If you're compensation, you expect to be compensated with muscular development and the response of muscle hypertrophy, i.e. you want to get jacked when you go to a gym. Well, I'll tell you, you're in many cases, you may be ripped off because you got all this visceral fat and you're not getting those muscle gains. That's why you're not getting it. And it's not because you're an older guy. If you're listening today to... Um, to Max's podcast, and you're disappointed uh, that you're when you're no longer getting the muscle mass uh, when you're when you're working out, uh, it's because you've got uh, undiagnosed, unknown to you, visceral fat, which is impeding your body's response to that stimulus. So long discussed in science is um, the the model of. Um, uh, stimulus affecting an organism with a response to it. And we see this time and time again, and this is well understood within the, the muscle bodybuilding community that it's, uh, you know, the more plates, you know, the popular podcast, more plates, more dates. Well, basically, you know, if you lift more weights, you're going to get more muscle mass, but not part of that discussion is the fact that that is predicated upon the level of health of the organism how healthy that person is. And so don't be uh, frustrated that, that you're old. Um, you need to refine your thinking. It's visceral fat, unhealthy fat depots within your body that are impairing your ability to respond uh, to the lifting weights, but it's way more than weightlifting. It's walking, it's sunshine, it's eating you know, good food. It is uh, being exposed to saunas. It's being exposed to cold temperatures. These kind of hormetic um, exposures that we get to that improves the body, they're all limited um, and restricted by visceral fat. So you're ripping yourself off. You're not getting as much money bang for your buck uh, uh, for uh, the the. the decisions that you do and the exercises that you do and all the practices that you're achieving. If you walk around tolerating this, this disease fat depots within your body. So hopefully we're beginning to reach people in this discussion uh, who are, are getting a little bit more comfortable and, and uh, say, my God, I better go and figure out if I got these fat depots within me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I love the point and I'm going to emphasize again, Sean, that it's the duration that you've had this metabolically active and, and kind of frankly poisonous tissue in your body. And to use more analogies, I think imagine if you had, uh, you know, a little piece of plutonium, something radioactive that's just constantly low level causing damage by just leaching out, you know, radioactivity or, or even a, a bottle of Roundup or glyphosate or Paraquat, you know, just slowly leaching poison, you know, into the soil. Um, that's essentially what 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 we're talking about when when we've got visceral fat in place. The you, you mentioned the muscle you know my muscle hypertrophy, and I think this is a a great um, opportunity now to talk about a couple of the other people 
in the lifestyle and health optimization space. And I'd lo- love to get your opinion. Um, I did a series of podcasts with Dr. Jack Cruz, who um, you might you're familiar with, who's very much emphasizes um, light in terms of uh, and, and our circadian rhythm and, and mitochondrial health. He he made the interesting point in one of my uh, interviews that it, it wasn't hypertrophied muscles on their own do not guarantee longevity um and he gave the the uh, the uh, example of the sherpa as being very high performing athletes who who don't have uh hypertrophied muscles um also this idea that the super centenarians that um a researcher called near Barzilai in new york studied um they were almost uh they're all chubby old guys uh meaning that um they were they had a, a degree of uh subcutaneous but not not visceral fat. So um, what what's your take on muscle hypertrophy as a strategy to to um to to extend life? Do you do you think that um it is necessary or do you think um simply the absence of the visceral fat um should be the main goal? Yeah, no, that's so good. Um I think it's myopic uh thinking to um pursue muscle gains and it's quite popular. We see it all over um, uh, immediately in gyms, you know, people, uh, people are going in there to, to get as much muscle as possible. And so, uh, I think it's a, uh, um, uh, a strategy that is, uh, close minded and really you need to be, uh, uh, pursuing the benefit that you get from weightlifting, which is, you know, healthy muscle that gets produced, but you uh, also want to make sure that you're not doing so uh, at the expense of your health, where you're ignoring visceral fat and uh, also just myopically, you know, putting on as much muscle as possible. So um, bodybuilders oftentimes, you know, uh, have a quality of life that is uh, favorable and good because they, they can do things and perform well uh, that other people can't, such as uh, couch potatoes. But uh, when you really study them, um, you still find a number of them looking really bad. I, mean, I was just looking at uh, poor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now he's 75 years old, so you know he's 15 older, 15 years older than me. But there he is, like his pecs are almost gone; they're just drooping down. Uh, he has no um, tonicity. He looks like he's suffering from sarcopenia. And I mean, I, my thought is like, is this guy taking uh, any any uh, 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 prescription hormones or anything to try to to help out and you know work and his nose is huge uh, I was like in flame face I was like gosh you know if if only he had paid attention to uh, visceral fat um, he he did he did he he'd be in a lot better shape at the age of 75 so um, it, it becomes I think fair to uh, raise the question um about the possibility that certain bodybuilders and people trying to, and I encountered this uh, online quite a bit, um, have a, bo- a, a form of body dysmorphism where they, they're they pursuing things uh, to, to such a level that it becomes uh, unhealthy. And sort of the opposite extreme of this would be anorexics who um, just want to be so thin, you know, completely and, and don't care if they don't have any muscle mass, uh, don't have fat. They, they just want to be ultra thin. I think, you know, that has, um, been the case, you know, people are aware of, uh, anore- anore- anorexia. Um, interesting. It used to be kind of dominate. If you remember, you know, 15 years ago, you're probably a young, pretty young guy, but it was in the news a lot, anorexia. And we almost never hear about it anymore. It's been replaced by the other dysmorphic condition of a uh, obese so there you know sadly i think there are people you know it, it's it's uh you know and everybody obesity is so prevalent that uh it's now um almost being tolerated and there are oddly enough people that are even attracted to obese states and, yeah. and uh, you know to- tolerant attitudes at least could be fair uh fair to attribute to them about obesity but yeah i think what you know the ideal uh optimal state of a human being is probably somebody who's got a lean body mass with without a um you know muscle 
uh, fatty infiltrates without myosteatosis. Um, they're not burdened with too much muscle, but they have an optimal amount of uh, muscle. Um, that, that amount of muscle is probably going to be uh, different from every person, but I think we can do a better job uh, than where we are right now in leading uh, the research and, and discussions about, you know, how much muscle you want to have. And certainly, you know, there's, there's balance to, to um, how our bodies look uh, by uh, asking how our bodies perform. So um, as, a, as a, an example that I, I was astounded that the world's strongest man who could, I don't know if he benched or he squatted or what, dead pressed the most amount of weight. He was on a TV show that was popular. I think it's called uh, uh, Game of Thrones um, in, in America. I don't know if it's still around. I never actually saw it, but he's a, he was a character. He was a huge muscle-bound guy. Um, strongest man in the world, he couldn't do one pull up. So, you know, the functionality of him it, it is, it's almost like he was a one trick pony. He could, he can, he could lift an enormous amount of weights, but I'm wondering if he was in a, a house that was on fire, could he climb out of a window? Yeah. Yeah. Probably not. He was, he was yeah. save his life. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, there, it's why I, as a health and performance optimizing physician, define the, the level of uh, biology that you want to live towards and try to achieve as made up of two factors. One, how you look, and two, how you perform. And um, I think it's really uh, an imperative on anybody uh, who wants to get the highest quality of life from birth to death to be uh, pursuing those two per those two objectives. And the first is not one out of vanity. Um, how you look really is um, for uh, health. So vanity might have you wearing cosmetics and fancy clothes. Uh, when you, how you look when it comes to the matter of health is um, how, how, uh, how your body, how healthy appearing is your body without um, external, you know, exogenous efforts. You know, you don't want to mm. be what I call a, an Earl Scheib uh, car paint job where you just get your old clunker painted, you know, <laughs> and you, you think that that's improved the, the car. Yeah. Um, it has. Uh, and so you want to really be improving your body from the inside out, um, the, the appearance of that body in terms of the shape, the contours, the tonicity of the muscles, the quality of hair, the amount of hair, the the appearance of a uh, of a uh, of uh, the vasculature, veins, uh, and arteries, and and uh, and nail beds. You know, mm. all of this that become indices of how uh, healthy you uh, are by by the appearance and the ability of an educated, informed consumer to look at their body. And I will say, you know, and then it's same thing for performance, how well you perform, you know, look at an old person who's filled with disease. They walk horrible. You know, sometimes they're limping to one side, you know, listing to one side. And then there's an old person that just walks effortlessly and gracefully. And, uh, and so how you, how you look and how you perform really are very, very important questions that, that we need to be, um, I think, uh, promoting uh, people to be routinely thinking about instead of uh, what's foisted on them, that they, they simply think their health comes down to, you know, blood tests. LDL you know, cholesterol. Or, yeah, cholesterol is. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the key point um, w when you mentioned uh, appearance is, to me, it's the absence of signs of of visible signs of visceral fat, which is the inflamed face, the widened nose, the telendactasias, all these signs that we haven't mentioned in this podcast, but Sean has gone over in depth in his his previous content. Um, and to, to take it back just to the point about um, what Dr. Jack Cruz was talking about is that those Sherpa, which he's talking about as the highest performing athletes on the planet, they would all have very little visceral fat. They'd all have no signs of of uh, insulin resistance or or kind of uh, inflamed faces. They are all incredibly um, high performing athletes. And uh, the the other point I wanted to make is that um, 
the idea of hypertrophying the muscles or burying my, mitochondrial density in muscles as opposed to the the brain or the heart, which are the the reasons why people die the most through neurodegenerative and cardiac diseases. Um, it, it, it does make sense. Um, to me, the the simplest thing that people can do is simply work out outside because, um, you know, we do have non-visual photoreceptors on our skin. The melanopsin is expressed in our blood vessels. So if you're working out and hard, you know, at a circadianly inappropriate time, like mid, you know, 11 p.m. or and you're exposed to artificial blue light um, while you're doing this heavy exercise, to me, that is that's that is a recipe for um you, you know, optimizing in the wrong direction, just like the gent that you mentioned, Sean, who can deadlift a ton but can't um, do a single pull-up. So I think that the underlying message is is the same between, I guess, the three of us, which is um, work out and, and be optimized in an evolutionarily appropriate way, in a way that is appropriate to nature. Um, you know, get sunlight, do your workouts, do your sprinting outside, um, have uh, a body that is functional, be able to climb be able to jump, be able to sprint, um, and don't have signs of, of of visceral fat, whether that's a protuberant abdomen or um, you know an inflamed nose and a, and a puffy face. Yeah, I completely agree with you and uh, Jack on that. I I work uh, I work out, uh, do my exercising out, outdoors in the sunshine. It's uh, one, it just feels better, but two, to your point. Um, I really do think that it's uh, exercise in the correct manner to to get the optimal gains, and to and I think it's really um, a detrimental process, uh, at least in part, to be exercising indoors under artificial lighting. So you're spot on about that. There's so much we could talk about, you know, with health optimization, the different different ways to to exercise and achieve that. I think this was a great discussion um, on these these particular biomarkers. And, and uh, I hope we, in the future, you and I can have other podcasts where we get into some of these. Uh, into the nuances. To improve yeah. You. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sean. It was an absolute pleasure. And um, again, I think this episode can stand as a bit of a, uh, a signpost for other doctors, but also patients about why they should definitely go and get a MRI scan for, for, to identify visceral fat. So I'll, I'll put a link to all your material so that um, people can, can find you. And um, so, yeah, thanks again. Yeah. Well, thank you, Max. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to come uh, on your podcast and, and to promote awareness to your, to your followers about these important biomarkers and what else they can do to, uh, become the best uh, biological versions of themselves uh, they, they possibly can. Great. Thanks, Sean. Talk soon. Yeah. Thank you, Max. All right. What did you all think of that discussion? I think Sean is doing such incredible work popularizing and promoting MRI scanning for visceral fat. And to me, it's such an important biomarker that is so influential for people's health that is simply not being emphasized or not being talked about. Uh, for the moment, uh, I'm using a waist circumference and a waist to height ratio to give me uh, an estimate of the amount of visceral fat someone's carrying, um, but nothing compares to that high resolution direct visualization uh, that something like an MRI scan or a CT can offer. And for obvious reasons, we're not wanting to uh, CT people because of the, the ionizing radiation. So that's where MRI is coming in. And I think the more we can offer it to people, the more it's going to be taken up and the more ben benefit we can start uh, offering to people. I love how practical Sean's approach is and this idea that the way we look and the way we perform are the ultimate um, or I guess the most important determinants of health. I think that's very, very powerful. Uh, towards the end of the podcast, I raised a couple of Dr. Jack Cruz's ideas with Sean, and uh, I think there's a lot in common here. Uh, Sean made the point that uh, muscle hypertrophy as a health strategy is not um, an ideal uh, approach. And the, I guess the the goal of having a muscled body per se is not is not the uh, the end or the point. The point is to have a functional body and to have that absence of uh, markers of visceral fat. And having muscle as a as will not be a natural byproduct of eating uh, a high protein, high fat uh, diet and being 
uh, physically active. So I thought that was a, a great episode. Post any comments below, subscribe, um, and share share the podcast out. I'll definitely be getting Sean on again, uh, perhaps to talk about some of these facial manifestations um, and these other signs of metabolic dysfunction and visceral fat that we can detect just by looking at someone. So uh, that's a very, very exciting and, and future uh, avenue or discussion point. So thanks very much, guys.